good to be back with you folks. I always forget how tall this pulpit is. This is like the tallest pulpit in the Western Hemisphere. But one thing that I, that I love about this pulpit, I, mean, I think, Craig, I need to turn the switch on here. Oh, there we go. Is I love this plaque up here. I miss seeing this. It says, Sir, we would see Jesus. John 12, 21. A good reminder to everyone who stands in this pulpit. Uh, and uh, I'm grateful that uh, every Sunday, Pastor Josh is standing in this pulpit. I've been blessed to uh, befriend him and uh, get to know him a little bit over the last few months. And, uh, and he is an answer to prayer for us, and I know for you. And, uh, and, and I'm just so grateful for what God is doing here. God orchestrated all of this, uh, and, uh, and he, he will be glorified uh, through it. And so... Uh, I, I can stand up here and just small talk and chit chat and we can talk memories and all that, but that's not why I drove 400 miles to get here and that's not why you've come today. We're going to have lunch later, so, you know, I may go past 12 o'clock, but that's okay because we're having lunch downstairs. And, uh, and, and we'll catch up there, but what we want to do right now is turn our attention to God's Word. And I want to share with you a passage of Scripture that has been burning on my heart over these months as I've prepared for this day. And uh, it's one that is familiar to some of you, should be anyway to uh, some of you, because almost 15 years ago exactly I preached this same text here. As I looked through my notes on Philippians, uh, I had a little note in the margin that I had preached this text on July the 4th, 1999 here. And uh, if you're the kind that notes your Bibles and you're still carrying a Bible from that long ago, you'll see that notation there. But let's look together at Philippians 1, 3 through 11. <clears throat> this is Paul's very personal letter to the Philippians. And I want you to hear these words as a very personal word from me also. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more, in real knowledge and discernment, all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, some of you are uh, unfamiliar uh, as I look about. Many of you are familiar, and I'm glad to see some unfamiliar faces. That means that God is uh, still blessing and moving and bringing people into this uh, faith family, but... Uh, uh, if you don't know me and my family, or if you have forgotten us, uh, <laughs> 11 years ago we moved away, having uh, been here for over five years as part of this church family. And, uh, you know, I used to hear Gene Helton say that when he dreamed at night, home was always Conway. And uh, I've had a few of those dreams myself over the last... Uh, 11 years. So they say that absence makes the heart grow fonder, and the longer we've been away from you, the more I find myself thinking of you all with the kind of feelings that Paul uh, has written here in this letter to the Philippian church. Uh, Paul and this Philippian church were partners in the gospel. And if you read through the New Testament, especially through Paul's letters, you see that his relationship with this church was very unique. Uh, and this partnership that they had in the gospel was the reason why. And uh, my prayer is that as we go on serving the Lord in our respective places, that we will continue to have this kind of relationship, a partnership in the gospel. And 
see what God can do uh, working together uh, with each of us doing what we can to serve Him. So what's involved in this kind of partnership in the gospel? Well, uh, if we take a look inside this long prayer that we've just read, uh, we'll see the elements of that partnership in the gospel. And the first one is this, that partnership in the gospel requires, really, joyful affection. The word translated joy in verse 4, always offering prayer with joy, is a term that occurs 140 times in the New Testament, approximately 15 times in Philippians, this word and its related words. So prominent is it in Philippians that some people have said this is the whole theme of the book. It's, it's a book about joy. Well, I, that's clever. I don't think that's the theme of the book. I think the theme of the book is this partnership in the gospel. But in order to have that partnership in the gospel, there has to be joy. Joyful affection. Now, what is joy? I, I looked it up in, in a definition, in a dictionary, to find an explicit definition for joy. And it says, intense and especially ecstatic or exultant happiness. And yet, I don't think that's what Paul has in mind when he speaks of joy. Uh, happiness reflects the horizontal perspective of our lives, how our circumstances are moving along. But joy is more vertical. One scholar says that joy is ultimately rooted in an unshakable faith in God and springs from a deep conviction that God acts to save His people. So that being the case, see, joy transcends our life circumstances. Uh, yesterday, we uh, took this a beautiful afternoon yesterday, and we spent the afternoon out at Fort McHenry. And at one point, we were kind of sitting in the shade, just looking out at the boats coming and going. And you know, there's these buoys and channel markers there. And uh, and if you ever watch a buoy or a channel marker, you see that they bounce around, they move back and forth, up and down, they go, you know. And they're tossed all over the place. But down at the bottom, there's an anchor that holds it firmly in place. And if I could contrast happiness and joy that way, happiness in your life is going to go up and down. It's going to move around a lot because your circumstances are always changing. But if you know Christ and you trust in the sovereign God who accomplishes all things for His own glory, according to the purposes of His own will, you know that there can be a joy in your life that stays fixed in Him no matter what happiness comes and goes. Now, that's the kind of joy that Paul's talking about when he says he's offering prayer with joy, this kind of joy that is secured in the faithfulness of God. That kind of joy, by the way, the Bible says you can't just manufacture. You can't try hard to be that joyful and work that up. That is a fruit of the Spirit. So it's only as the Holy Spirit indwells us and empowers us that we can have that kind of joy in our lives. And Paul has that kind of joy. He exemplifies it here because I'll remind you that he's writing this letter from prison. He's writing from a situation, a circumstance that we would think is not very enjoyable. But Paul says, you know, even sitting here in this prison, writing this letter under these circumstances, I have a joy in my heart as I think of you all and as I pray for you all. So in the midst of discomfort and disconcerting circumstances, he's staring at death sentence square in the face. Paul says, I still have joy. And especially when it comes to how I think of you all. Now, that joyful affection. Notice it's all-encompassing. And as I thought of a way to summarize what Paul is saying here, is he's saying it's, it's, this joy is in all of him for all of them. It's a joyful affection. Verse 7, he says, It's only right for me to feel this way about you all. The word translated feel, most often uh, rendered with words that have to do with the mind or with thinking. And so joy is not just a case of emotional tingles for Paul. It's something that <coughs> occupies his mind. He's thinking about how joyful these uh, partners in the gospel make him. And then, and then he says, I have you in my heart. The Greek word there is cardiac. It's a familiar word if you've ever talked about cardiac 
things. Uh, then in verse 8, I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. The word that's translated affection there. Um, let's see, how can I put this delicately? Uh, it has to do with your inner organs. Uh, and, uh, and so what Paul is saying here is that uh, his mind, his heart, his innermost being is wrapped up in joy. For this church that uh, he is writing to. But notice that he says it's right that I feel this way about you all. Every single one of them. There's no favoritism. There was no status there. That's a theme of Philippians. Uh, in verse 1 he says he's writing to them all. Verse 3 he's thankful for them all. Verse 4 he's joyful for them all. Verse 7 he feels this way about them all. Verse 8 he longs for them all. 51 times in this short little letter, Paul uses the second person plural pronoun that we in the South would render y'all. Can you say that word here? Y'all? Y'all know what y'all is? Uh, <laughs> I remember when we first moved up here, uh, you know, we were talking to some of the youth and, and they were like trying to get Donya to say words because they just thought we talked fun. You know? <laughs> and, you know, y'all. That's what Paul is saying. You plural, y'all. Not to mention a number of times he uses a, a verbs that assume a y'all as the subject. So as you think about this, Paul is saying all of me feels this way about all of you. This joyful affection. And I wonder, can you look around in this room today and, and say that honestly? When you think about your church family, when you think about the people that are seated around you this morning, I mean, do you, can you say, all of me has joyful affection for all of them? <coughs> Maybe when you think of church, you don't think of everyone. You think of a select group of people. Uh, certain people that are in your small group or Sunday school class or, you know, in your ministry area or your circle of fellowship. But we need to broaden our thinking to consider all God's people and how we feel about them all. Partnership in the gospel involves a joyful affection that is in all of me for all of you. And that should be true of all of us as we uh, seek to be in this kind of fellowship, this kind of partnership in the gospel. Well, how do we know that we have that kind of joyful affection? Well, uh, one way that it's detectable is in how we pray for each other. If we're going to be partners in the gospel, then we have to pray with thanksgiving for each other. Paul says, I thank my God in my every remembrance of you. And again, that's y'all. Uh, I'm so thankful for all of you. When, when I pray for Conowingo Baptist Church, I'm just filled with gratitude to God for the fellowship and the relationships that we have here in this church and the blessings that we shared together over so many years. But I wonder, as you pray for your church, can you envision all the members, all those who are here, and be thankful for them all? Just maybe take a look around you right now. Think of three people seated near you that are not related to you. And uh, is that, uh, some of you may not be seated near three people who are related to you. But maybe you have to look across the room to find somebody who's not related to you. But if you can think about three people who's not related to you, are you thankful for? Think of some. Think of something that you can be thankful for about that person. And you know, this is a great exercise for a church to do. I think yeah, once you get that in your mind, maybe sometimes during sometime during lunch today, why don't you just pull that person aside and say, you know, I'm really thankful for you, and this is why. If we let each other know that, how much richer would our church fellowship life would be? If we let each other know on a regular basis how grateful we are for each other. That's a partnership in the gospel. Well, you might say, well, I don't, I, the person that I'm thinking of right now, I don't like that person. Or you might say, well, I, I like them just fine, but they don't like me. Well, I suspect that the best thing you could do about that is to begin praying with grateful affection for them. And I think that God will change the way you feel about that person. And God will eventually change the way that person feels about you. Because you can't hate somebody 
that you're praying for and that you're thankful for. And you can't hate somebody who's thankful for you and praying for you. And so uh, this is a good remedy for what ails many churches, to pray for one another with this kind of grateful thanksgiving and affection. Now, as you pray for another person in the church, you might say, well, I, I, I want to pray for them. I just don't know what to pray for them. Maybe you don't know what they're going through or what their needs are. Well, you could ask them. But if you don't want to do that, or even if you do ask them, there are some things that you can pray for every follower of Jesus Christ. And Paul gives us a model of that in verses 9 through 11. He says, this is what I'm praying. When I pray for you all, this is what I pray. That your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. You can pray that for every Christian. Pray for them to abound in love. For them to abound in knowledge and spiritual discernment. Pray for them to be sincere and blameless and, and to persevere in their faith until the end for God's righteousness which has been imparted to them by faith in Christ to now be manifest through them when others look upon them, ultimately that God would be glorified in all of us. Now, I could say to you that every time I think of you all, I give thanks to God and I pray for you with this kind of prayer. But ultimately, I hope you pray for one another that way. Pray for your pastor that way. If you think of us, pray for me and my family that way. Because that's the kind of thing that you find in a partnership in the gospel. Joyful affection, prayerful gratitude. Now, another thing, authentic fellowship. Authentic fellowship. The reason why Paul was so joyful, so thankful, so prayerful about the Philippians is they were co-laborers in the work of Christ's kingdom. Now, the Philippian church wasn't sitting back waiting for emails from Paul saying that he'd reached the world for Jesus. They, they were partnering with him in that. Uh, he wasn't on some pedestal, you know, doing all the work or shouting out all the orders to them. They were partners in the task. And the word that Paul uses to describe their partnership is the Greek word that some of us are familiar with, koinonia. Uh, many Christians have heard that term, koinonia. It means fellowship. But just because we know that word or know what it translates to doesn't mean we really understand what fellowship is. If I were to ask somebody, you know, uh, how's the fellowship in your church? You say, well, we're having one right after service today. Uh, we're, we're convinced that it has something to do with casseroles and ham, fried chicken, something like that. I, you guys will appreciate this. I have this uh, friend. Uh, he, he is a little larger than I am. And he was talking to a pastor search committee the last uh, few years, and one of the members of the search committee said, I just have one question for you. Do you eat fried chicken or not? <laughs> and he said, ma'am, you just think this is a belt? He said, this is a fence around a chicken graveyard. <laughs> He's been to a lot of fellowships. He's been to a lot of fellowships. I have no objection to those kinds of fellowships, as you can tell. You may well remember but eating together is not the definition of fellowship, nor is it a substitute for authentic fellowship. Now, it can be an expression of fellowship, it can even be a path to fellowship, but it is not the meaning of or a substitute to real fellowship. You can eat all the fried chicken that the Dublin market can crank out and still not have fellowship, or you can never eat a bite together and have real, authentic fellowship. It's not about food. It's not about food. So what is it about? Well, there's several things that real fellowship is about. It's about a common foundation. Verse 5, Paul says, in view of your participation, your partnership in the gospel. That's the foundation. For people to have fellowship, they have to have something in common. Now, in Acts 16, we meet the original members of the Philippian church. Uh, if they had charter members, uh, these would have been the charter members. There was a woman named Lydia, a wealthy Gentile businesswoman. 
There was a demon-possessed slave girl who had been converted out on the street. There was a Philippian jailer, working class family man. They didn't have a lot in common with each other. Then along comes Paul, a converted Jew, zealous for the gospel, traveling about preaching the good news of Jesus. Now, I don't know if you could ever assemble a more diverse group of people than that. They were different in almost every way imaginable. Different walks of life, different socioeconomic standings, different genders, different ages. But they had one thing in common. The gospel of Jesus Christ. And that one thing is a sure and solid foundation to build fellowship in the body of Christ upon. Christian fellowship is built on the foundation of the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God has become a man in the person of Jesus Christ. He lived a sinless life that you couldn't live. He died a substitutionary death that you should have died. So that in Him, our sins can receive their just penalty under the wrath of God. And that we can be saved and forgiven, covered in His very own righteousness. He has conquered death through His resurrection. And He has secured eternal life for all who trust in Him. That's good news. And when you meet another Christian, you meet somebody who has that in common with you. That they were a sinner who was saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And so what difference does it make? What else you don't have in common when you have that in common? The Bible says that before we meet Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, just imagine that uh, miraculously tomorrow morning, two people out here in the cemetery dug their way out and started walking around and, and ran into each other and said, hey, uh, how are you? Well, I was just dead a few hours ago. So was I. Something happened and now I'm alive and I don't know what to make of it. Do you think those two people are going to sit there and bicker with each other over what they don't have in common when they have this really amazing thing in common that they were dead and they've been brought back to life? That is what the story is for us who are in Christ. We were dead. By the grace and mercy of Christ, we've been made alive. So you look different than me, you talk different than me, you dress different than me, you smell different, I don't know, you can add, go on, go on. It doesn't matter. What matters is that we have this in common. We have been saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Our partnership in the gospel is the foundation of our fellowship. But then he says a word about the duration of this fellowship. He says that in verse 5, that this participation in the gospel, this partnership in the gospel has been going on from the first day until now. And Christian fellowship is cultivated over time. The first day, Paul mentions, this is a day some 10 years before this, described in Acts 16 when he comes into Philippi and encounters Lydia and she was saved there. She invited Paul and his companions in, into her home for hospitality and that became the seed of the church in Philippi. And from that day, a decade before, until the time he's writing this letter, their fellowship has grown stronger and stronger and stronger. Now, Josh and I were just talking before the service about this phenomenon. I don't know if you've heard of this, but I hear it's all the rage out west. Uh, <coughs> there's this phenomenon called the honeymoon, where a pastor comes in, and you know, for the first six months to a year, everything's just perfect, and everything's going great, and everybody loves everybody, and it's all wonderful, and Jesus is Lord. Maybe you're in the midst of that sort of situation right now. <laughs> it might come to an end one day. I, I wish I didn't have to say that. I, I don't know much about these honeymoons. I never had one. Uh, <laughs> I never had one. Uh, but from what I hear, sometimes they come to an end. Things have to start getting real. Disappointments, discouragements, bad things come in. Well, everything can kind of go haywire. All of a sudden, people realize their pastor doesn't walk on water. Pastor 
realizes that many in his congregation have not reached glorification yet, the sanctification process still working its way out. Turmoil can break out. That's what I hear from other pastors. Out west. I don't think it's ever happened around here. But I just tell you, I think that seems a little backward. I think it seems a little backward for a guy to come in on the first day, you know, hey, it's great, it's wonderful, it's perfect, and then six months later say, well, it's all haywire now. It ought to be the opposite way. Guy comes in, he said, mm, yeah, we'll see about you. You know, we'll see how it goes. And the more you get to know each other, the more you build that fellowship in the gospel. The more you come to appreciate each other in spite of one another's faults. Because you have this foundation, this fellowship that's in the gospel. Paul says, you know, yeah, we used to be partners in the gospel for about a year, a long time. No, no, no. He says, we've been partners in the gospel from the first day until now. He came into town. All of a sudden, he's preaching the gospel. People say, well, I think I'll believe that. And then 10 years later, he says, we still have this beautiful kind of partnership. Now, church, I love you. And I love your new pastor. And, and, and remember, I know some of you very well. We had some great times together. And we had some challenging times together. I can remember a lot of things. I mean, just sitting in here, I'm just like overwhelmed with memories. Everywhere I look, I can think of something that happened there in that place, you know. And, and I remember we had uh, some state convention consultants come in one time on a Sunday evening and guided us through some difficulties that we were having. And we met right down in the fellowship hall. And we plotted out a timeline on the wall, highs and lows in the history of this church. Any of you remember that? Uh, and, and, and we concluded something together. That the low points of this church's history happened when the church got its eyes off of the Lord Jesus and began expecting unrealistic things of its pastor. I think the phrase that we used in that meeting was we, we had become pastor-focused. Now, Josh, these are great people. In fact, some of the finest people I've ever known are in this church. Uh, I pray that you'll love them, and that you'll lead them, and that you'll endure with them for a long time. They are perfect, and they will disappoint you at some point. But I hope you can love them beyond their faults and stay long enough to make a tremendous impact for the Lord Jesus in this community and to the ends of the earth. Uh, as you partner together in the gospel. That's what I want to say to Josh. But now I want to talk to the rest of you. Because <laughs> I think you got a good man. Yeah, I, I've been enjoying getting to know him. In fact, uh, some of you will remember five years ago or so, Donya and I came back up here and we thought about coming back to be a part of you again. And ultimately we concluded that God wasn't finished with us in Greensboro. And as I look back on that decision, as difficult as it was to make at that time, uh, I don't know that I've ever discerned God's leading more clearly in my life. And in the intervening years, I mean, it happened almost like that. That as soon as we said we're going to stay put, God just opened the windows of heaven and started outpouring blessings on our church family. I, I just think it was a time where God was saying He's testing me to see if I was going to stay or go. And when I said I was going to stay, it was like God just, just opened up the windows and blessed us. And, and, and as I look at what's happened here with you all, and the fact that you have Josh and his family here now, I mean, I'm so glad that I didn't get in the way of that. I'm just so glad that God made that very clear because you wouldn't be where you are now. I wouldn't be where I am now. I believe, as I just get to know Him, that He is God's man for you at this time. But He isn't Jesus. I shook his hand just a little while ago. There were no nail prints in him whatsoever. <laughs> he isn't perfect. And if I know pastors, and I know church folks, I know that one day he'll disappoint you. I hope not. I mean, you know, I'm not praying for that or anything. I'm not trying to start a new ministry, but a church disappointment. <laughs> But I mean, that's just what happens, you know? You put two porcupines in a cage together, one of them's going to get stuck, right? 
And that's what happens when you get sinners in a church, you know, growing in the Lord together. Somebody's going to get disappointed. And when that happens, I pray that you'll love Him in spite of those imperfections that you find. It's very, very nice hair, very nice smile. <laughs> but you'll find something in there that disappoints you. And uh, when you do, love it. Love it. Stand beside them. Look over those imperfections that you find in one another. The same way that Christ has dealt with yours by His blood. And you build this fellowship together around the Gospel, not around His personality or His giftedness or anybody's pet projects, but you keep your eyes on the Lord with one another. And you have a great future when you do that in partnership in the Gospel. That's what I pray for. That's what I hope for. And that's what I expect by God's grace and for His glory to happen here. For that to happen, you're going to need a lot of understanding. This is pastor and people. You're going to need a lot of understanding. Patience, love, honesty, trust, grace. And over time, you build that kind of fellowship. It, it takes time to develop that. But if you're committed to it from the first day, Paul says, then you can look back on it years later and be thankful for what God has done. Authentic fellowship. Founded on the gospel. It, its duration is ongoing. It begins the first day and it grows from that day. It doesn't go south it grows. Now, a brief word about the action of fellowship. I mean, why do we have this fellowship? You have this wonderful gospel-centered fellowship, and then what do you do with it? Why are you in fellowship with one another? Well, <clears throat> the action is seen in what Paul's saying here uh, when he talks about the defending and the confirmation of the gospel. <clears throat> he says, it's only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and condemnation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. The word defense here is where we get the word apologetics. It's a defense of the truthfulness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The confirmation, the guaranteeing, the proving, of the security. We live in a day in which the culture around us is demanding from us a reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. Never before in America have we seen such a diverse mixture of worldviews. And uh, it could be pessimistic, you know, to look out and say, well, it's just the world just going to hell in a handbasket, you know. But we believe that the gospel is the answer to this. And so we have to be engaged in the task of defending the gospel and confirming the gospel. And we do that through our everyday conversation with others and through the living witness of personal holiness in our lives. That's the action of fellowship. The action of fellowship is defending and confirming the gospel. Because when we come together as diverse peoples with very little in common except for Jesus, we're presenting a bold witness to our community and to the world. When, when we come together, we come together to share about the opportunities that we've had to impact others with the gospel. I was so grateful for the prayer request earlier about uh, a friend who, who's you know, sensing that conviction and needing to, to grow and needing to come to the place where she can call upon Christ. I mean, that's that we come together to share those kinds of things with each other, and then we go out to keep doing it. We don't go out alone, we go out together. Each one's doing his or her part to spread the fame of Christ and enrich His kingdom. Sometimes things will go bad when you do that kind of thing. It did for Paul. It might for you. But the good news is, is that even when we suffer for the gospel, we suffer together. It's part of the fellowship. Paul says his imprisonment is part of the grace that they share. Does it sound like grace to me? But, you know, yeah, he says here, God's granted this to us so we can suffer together. And when a church labors together and witnesses together and even suffers together, that is a bold testimony to the authentic fellowship that that church has. That's part of the partnership in the gospel, authentic fellowship. 
It's built on the gospel. It's built over time. It's built as we labor together and suffer together if we need be. Now, I'm going to say one final thing. <clears throat> and that's the partnership in the gospel requires bold confidence. As we look toward the future, we need to look to the future with confidence. Paul demonstrates it in this verse. In verse 6, I'm confident this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Notice it's not self-confidence. It's not saying, I know this, and I'm going to do this and that. No, that's not what he says. And notice it's not uh, confidence in other people. I just believe that Luke and Timothy are going to come through for me. You know, Paul knew full well that people will disappoint you, fall short of your expectations of them. There will be days that we all fail to live up to one another's expectations. I remember some of those days, and so do you. So our confidence in the future is not rooted in ourselves. Partnership in the gospel means having a bold confidence that the God who called us together in this fellowship knows what He's doing and is fully capable of accomplishing His purpose even through the likes of us. It's God who's the center, the object of Paul's confidence. And it is God who must be the focus of your confidence as you look to the future. Paul has a confidence that because... God is the originator of the work, it will be completed. And it will be completed well. He says, He who began a good work in you. I firmly believe that God has been doing a good work here on this hill for many years. I tried to figure it out. And am I right? Who's the historian here? Is it 89 years this year? 89 years that God's been doing a good work here. That's a long time. Some of you remember some good old days here. Some of my favorite memories. One of them I, I just thought of a little while ago. Some of you might remember we had Joe Hester come in and preach revival. Joe was a dear friend of mine. Joe and Margie now are both with the Lord. But I remember Joe preaching in this pulpit. And he says, uh, he says to Margie, his wife, he says, Margie, would you come play something on the piano? Because I have to go do what that pill makes me have to do. <laughs> That's like one of my favorite memories of all time. happened right here. I, 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 just, I remember some great times uh, sharing the gospel out in Salem, Massachusetts. Jamie, I think that last trip I got threatened and being arrested out there. Great, that was a great time. Uh, this Pat, I remember... You walking into that hotel in West Africa and seeing that fish laid out there, you know, and it almost made you pass out. You know? <laughs> that was great. No. <laughs> and we had some good times, you know. And some of you remember even further back than that. You can remember great days with Gene and, and with Pastor Bertram. I mean, you know, just I, I, my knees still knocked this morning seeing his picture out there, you know. I mean, when I stood here thinking I was filling those men's shoes, you know. Good days. Good days in the past. God has been doing a great work here for a long time. You've got a rich history that you can be proud of. Don't live in it. Don't live in it. You're a church, not a museum. Museums focus on the past. Churches look to the future. You call a pastor, not a curator, not a preservationist, not an archaeologist. It's forward movement. The pastor's a shepherd. The shepherd leads. Leads a flock as it moves forward. Forward movement. Like Paul, our confidence is not in the sheep, not in the shepherd, but in the God who began this good work so long ago and will complete it. It will be perfected, he says. It will be completed. God's purposes cannot be thwarted. I'm certain that if you remain true to His Word and faithful to Him, as you walk with Him and witness for Him, that God will never give up on you. He will continue shaping us all, molding us all into who He wants us to be, who He's called us to be, and what He's called us to do. He's not going to give up on His own until the day of the glorious return of Christ. I'm confident of this very thing, Paul says, that He who began... A good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. We long for that day. Because on that day, the believer in Christ completes the journey. 
that sanctification process by which God has been shaping us and molding us into Christ's likeness is completed on that day because we are glorified like Christ for all eternity. 1 John 3 says, we know that when we see Him, we'll be like Him. We'll see Him as He is. I don't know when that day is going to be. I know, I used to know. But then, I, you know, I went to seminary and, and I learned some Greek and Hebrew words and I forgot when the day of Christ is going to be. But whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now or even further out than that, we know this, that we have bold confidence in our partnership in the gospel because God, who began this good work in us, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I'm excited about your future. And I'm excited to come here today and tell you that. I'm excited to be here today and tell you that I'm thankful for the days we had together. And I'm even more thankful for the days that you have ahead of you. I hope you're excited about it. I hope that this church will experience in the days and decades to come a true partnership in the gospel. Marked by this kind of joyful affection. This kind of uh, prayerful gratitude. Authentic fellowship and bold confidence. And uh, every now and then, you guys want to have a potluck meal, invite me back to see you again. I'll be glad to be <laughs> Even if you don't have the potluck. <laughs> but whether I'm here or in Greensboro or anywhere else that the Lord might have me know this, that in our household, you all are remembered. We thank God for you and we pray for you. And this is what we pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent, in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Father, grant that in this church's future days, there might be this kind of partnership in the gospel demonstrated by this kind of joyful affection, prayerful gratitude, authentic fellowship, and bold confidence. And may it bring glory to your name. We commit to you this people, this pastor, and trust it to you to complete the good work that you began here. In Jesus' name, amen.